Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Christy Morley and I am the Senior Naturalist at Wissahickon Trails. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Um, everybody should have come into the, the call tonight muted and I ask that you keep your microphones muted for the duration of the call. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat box and type your questions in there and I'll stop a couple times throughout the evening to answer those questions. Um, if you're having problems with video, if you turn your own camera off so that you're only um, using the bandwidth for my presentation, um, that might help strengthen your connection. So feel free um, to turn your camera off if you want to. And um, the recording will be available online. Um, I say usually within a week for most presentations, but a number of us are off for the ho upcoming holidays and the office is closed for a couple of days. So uh, it might be the beginning of December before we um, get this one actually posted for you, but it will be online uh, both on our website and our YouTube channel. So um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started and talk all about owls tonight. Uh, before I get into owls, I just want to take a minute to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, for those of us, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and may not be as familiar with Wissahickon Trails, uh, we were formerly known as Wissahickon Valley Watershed Association. We are an environmental nonprofit based in Amber, Pennsylvania, founded a little over 60 years ago, uh, and we work to protect the land and water of the upper Wissahickon Creek. And to date, we've saved nearly about 1,300 acres of land from development. We have 12 nature preserves and 24 miles of trails on that land. Um, we are a nonprofit, so we do rely on our supporters. Uh, if you're on the call tonight as a supporter of ours, thank you. Uh, my sincere thanks. The supporters that we have out in the community are what allow us to continue to do our mission and keep our preserves open and trails ready for you to go walking on. Um, whenever you want. So if you're not a supporter for, of ours or you're not um, as familiar with some of the work that we're doing, I encourage you to go take a look at our website. Um, there's loads of information on there on the various projects that we have going on, uh, information about all of our preserves and interactive trail maps so you can see where the closest parking is, um, where you might be access, have access to the trail closest to your house and those kinds of things. So I encourage you um, to check out that website. So my plan for tonight is to kind of cover four big sections. Um, we're gonna start first with a discussion of what makes an owl an owl. And then we're gonna talk about how to find an owl and which I know is what everybody wants to know. Where do I see them? How do I see them? Um, those are always the questions that I get the most whenever I do um, any kinds of presentations around birds or owls. Um, and, and people are always very curious to, to see them. And they are hard to find, I'll tell you that right now. So but I will give you a few tips and tricks and some things to keep in mind. And then I'm gonna break, um, talk about eight owls um, that are in our region. And it's divided into two sections, the owls that we have um, all year round here, and then the owls that we have here in the winter. And go through a little bit of the sort of life history of all of them. And you can see what they all look like if you're not familiar with them and learn some um, tips and tricks about um, how to find them. And I do have in each of those sections a slide about the best places to try and find them. Um, so get your note paper ready or get your camera ready so you can take a picture of that slide um, and it will be on, you know, online later. I throw these two pictures in here um, and usually when I'm doing this presentation, I'm doing it up, you know, in front of a room of full of people with a big screen um, distant from the people a little bit. And so it's actually fairly hard to see the two owls in these pictures. If you're looking at this on your computer screen tonight, it's probably a little bit easier for you to see them. But I throw these in here at the start of the presentation, just to sort of level set expectations because it is very, very possible to see owls in broad daylight uh, when they're roosting in a tree. But you have to know what you're looking for and you have to look very carefully. So in this picture here with all the leaves on the lower left, my cursor is going around the owl right here. Uh, there's an owl on the back side of this tree. I'm pretty sure that this is a long-eared owl, but it might be a great horned owl. It's kind of hard to tell um, actually from this picture. And then the big picture on the right-hand side, there is an Eastern screech owl uh, right here in the middle. Um, actually, 
let me rephrase that. That might also actually be Ray Mordell. Uh, but you can tell it's really camouflaged in there. And that's the whole point. That's often how you're going to see owls. So um, I'm going to go through some of those tips and tricks in here. And hopefully, um, you know, in your excursions looking for birds and owls in the future, um, they will help you um, find them. So let's jump into what makes an owl an owl. And first and foremost is all about their eyes. Um, they have eyes that are designed to process low light uh, because they operate at night most of the time. Um, their eyes are very large relative to their head size. I think I saw once the comparison to if, if human eyes proportionately were the same size as owls are, Owls' eyes are to their heads, we have like grapefruit size eyes. So that kind of gives you an idea of how big their eyes actually are relative to their head size. Their eyes contain a large number of rod cells. So the same cells that we have that allow us to have night vision. Um, and our night vision usually isn't very good, but it's there. We can see in low light a little bit. Um, they have a lot more of them. Um, so they're really designed to gather as little light that may be out there in the night from the, the, uh, the moon, even the stars a little bit, night glow from lights in the area, those kinds of things. They're, they're gonna be able to take that light and see much, much better than we can in the dark. And so they can actually fly around in the dark and not crash into things. Um, and then you'll notice on these pictures um, of the eyes that there's kind of this diagonal line across each eyeball here. And that's actually a protective membrane that uh, the owl has in its eye so that it can cover its, its eye ball itself and um, protect it as it's flying in the dark, diving into grass, um, maybe chasing small prey through areas that have um, branches and things like that um, so that it doesn't get poked in the eye as much. And that's not unique to owls. A number of other birds have those. Um, protective membranes as well, uh, but it is something else that helps them, um, you know, protect themselves in their hunting because they are hunters. In addition, um, unlike other birds, you'll notice the owl's eyes are front facing, just like ours. Most other birds, um, raptors excluded, so hawks um, and things like that, most other birds, their eyes are on the side of their head. So birds like this pigeon here don't actually have binocular vision. They are really looking out of each eye sort of separately and have more monocular vision off to the sides. And the areas where those eyes overlap for binocular vision, like we have two eyes facing forward is very, very small. But owls, because their eyes are front facing like ours are, they have much greater level of binocular vision um, and much more uh, ability to see in binocular fashion like we do, and that helps them um, with depth perception for hunting, which is very necessary um, for them to catch their prey. So owls have this very large facial disc, and all owls have this. Um, this is a great gray owl, and it's one of the largest owls in North America, so its facial disc and head are really big. Um, but all owls have this, and the idea is, is that it kind of acts as a giant radar dish and funnels sound to their ears. And you can actually make your own ears work like this. So if you are, excuse me, trying to hear owls, this is actually a really good way to try to listen for owls because oftentimes owl calls are very low. Um, they're a very low pitch sound. And so they may be harder to pick up. They do travel fairly far, but they may be harder for our ears to pick up. And you can make your head act like an owl's facial disc by putting your hands behind your ears. And if you sort of stretch your ears out a little bit, then your, your face basically acts like a facial disc as well. And that sound and your hands funnel that sound right into your ears. And that's exactly what happens um, with the owl's face. And to help them, they're ears are actually offset a little bit. So this is the skull of a boreal owl and the arrows here are pointing to the openings where their ears are. 
Um, so you can see that there's one sort of up and to the left and one down to the right. And that offset of the ears helps them triangulate on prey. So they're hunting, they're, they're, be, they're able to see in the dark much better than we are, but they're certainly not seeing like we would at broad daylight. Um, they do rely a lot on sound for hunting and the sounds that small mice or voles will make in the grass and those kinds of things. And so in order to zero in on where that prey may be, they need to figure out how high they are from the prey and how far away the prey is from them. And so those offset ears combined with the, the facial disc, the feathers that sort of amplify that sound into those ears, helps them triangulate and figure out exactly where their prey might be. Owls also have modified um, feathers that allow them basically to fly silently. Um, so there's a couple of things that they have. They, if you notice, if you've seen full body pictures of owls and you'll see this on some of the, the photos that I have for the individual species, um, they're very fluffy around their body feathers. Um, and if you've seen an outstretched owl wing anywhere, the, the feathers under their wing, the top are also very fluffy, unlike most birds that we see. Um, think of a, um, an American robin that you might see on your lawn. Occasionally it might puff itself up and look fluffy, but most of the time it kind of looks fairly sleek. The feathers are laid down. These puffy feathers really help absorb sound around the owl. So it helps them maintain silence because you can imagine sneaking up on something in the dark <laughs> that you want to eat for dinner. You need to try to remain as quiet as possible. Um, they also have special feathers on their wings uh, that they use as their flight feathers um, that help reduce sound. So there's little tattered edges and comb-like edges on one side that help um, bind those feathers together so that they don't make any sound. If you've ever heard morning doves or a pigeon take off, they do a lot of wing clapping. So there's a lot of noise when they take off and owls don't do that at all. They're completely silent when they take off. And lastly, uh, their feet, um, they have these tiny little feathers on them, which may help them sense prey um, when they're close. And also they have a flexible joint in their outer toe that helps them grip prey. Um, again, they are hunters, they are predators. And so they need some way to be able to make sure that they're um, able to grab that prey and fly with it um, or if they're not gonna fly away with it right away, keep it on the ground so that they can eat. And when they eat, uh, another thing that owls do, and this can actually help you find owls if you know what to look for, is owls form pellets. And pellets are literally the undigested part of their prey. So when an owl catches a prey, catches prey, and usually most owls eat uh, small mammals, but there is a large variability. Some owls eat ducks, some owls eat other owls or other birds. Um, some owls eat um, large mammals, like larger mammals like skunks, and uh, some eat insects. So there is a wide variety of, of prey, but the one thing that all of that prey has in common is that there's parts of it that aren't digestible and owls beaks are not designed to really chew like basically they swallow their prey whole um, and or torn into very large pieces and everything goes in and then they have digestive processes that separate out all of this undigestible fur bone things like that, uh, the exoskeleton of insects, snake scales, those kinds of things. And they regurgitate them. So this is a picture of a snowy owl regurgitating a pellet. And they do this generally twice a day, like every eight to 10 hours. Um, often they do it from the same perch. So if you know there's owls in an area, you can often try to find the perch by finding the pile of pellets on the ground. Um, this is not my feet. This is an example that I found on the internet. This is uh, a quarter for scale that the person put in there. And these are probably given the size great horned owl pellets. Um, but again, there is variation across species. Um, and sometimes you can kind of tell one species from another 
um, by either the size of the pellet or the composition of the pellet, should you decide to figure out what's in there. If you're really interested in understanding pellets and digging a little deeper, those of you who have kids at home, um, you can actually buy owl pellets um, through um, educational sources on Amazon. Um, they're sterilized and you can dissect them and find the bones and they usually come with a key to help you, you know, understand the bones that are in there. Um, but basically, you know, you can find little skulls uh, you can find, you know, like bones and all of that kind of stuff. And so this, again, this is not entirely unique to owls. Um, a lot of hawks do this and some other species of birds that tend to eat things that are non-digestible, um, that have fur or feathers or um, exoskeletons like grasshoppers and things like that. They will often um, expel pellets as well. Um, but this is one thing that, you know, owls tend to return to the same perches over and over and over again. And so we can use that as a clue to help us try to find them. So with that, we're going to go into how to find owls. And my first tip for you is patience. And I'll say it again, lots and lots of patience. Um, I've been a serious birder for almost 25 years. I saw my first saw wet owl last year in 2019 after a lot of years of trying to find a saw wet owl. And I've seen barred owls exactly three times. I've heard them a couple more times than that, but I've seen them three times. So even though I know what to look for, it's still not easy. So patience is the number one thing that I can give you. Um, if the first time you're not successful, try again, because they are out there. Um, it just may take some time. One of the things that you need to understand is what they need. And so if you have an area that has good daytime cover, so areas like um, uh, weedy hedgerows and edges of forests, um, areas that have upland forest and it's next to open farm fields or open fields of some kind. Um, if you have areas where salt marshes or freshwater marshes that back up to woodlands, um, those marshes are often really good places for owls to hunt at night and they'll take cover in the trees during the day. Coastal dunes and um, beaches are another actually really good place for owls to hunt at night. And they, we don't necessarily think of them as having a lot of life on them, but the dune areas of, of beaches can often be covered with shrubs and low plants, and there can be a lot of um, mice and small mammals in there at nighttime, and so they can actually be really good places to find owls. And they will either take cover in low, close by um, woodland edges or, you know, thicker tangles of shrubs maybe um, on some dunes. And some, as you'll see, actually may roost right out in the open on a dune. So um, all of those kinds of things, think about habitat. So good daytime cover in an area that they could have a good nighttime feeding habitat. The next part to how to find owls really is listening. Um, you are much, much more likely to actually hear an owl than you are to see an owl most of the time. So at dawn and dusk is when they're most active in terms of calling, although some you'll see call more later in the evening and more are very much more nocturnal. But especially during the breeding season, there's a couple of species of owls in our area that can be really noisy. And so if you learn their calls, and there's really only four or five that you need to learn, um, so it's not that hard, then you're going to be much more prepared to go out and listen um, in those areas that might have owls. Um, you've looked at the habitat, you think, yeah, this is an area that might, might be good for owls, um, and go out at dawn or dusk and listen. Um, especially during the breeding season. And we'll talk about when that is for each of the species of owls. And also pay attention to songbird mobbing behavior. If any of you are birders, you've probably seen this. Um, and even if you're not a birder, you may have seen crows going after a hawk that's sitting on top of a telephone pole, for example. 
or you've heard Blue Jays um, going absolutely crazy over something. That's typically what we call songbird mobbing behavior. And it, songbirds do that for a variety of reasons. Largely it's, hey, there's a predator here and we wanna to try to make it go away and we're gonna let everybody know that it's here uh, in the process. And so usually there's more than one bird and they bring in all their friends. So if the blue jays start it, a lot of times the chickadees and the tit might show up and then the cardinals might show up and sometimes even the woodpeckers come in and everybody starts making a lot of noise. And oftentimes the birds are kind of flying around and flitting between trees. And when you see that, now they don't always do that only for owls, but that can be a really good indication that there might be an owl in the area. And so pay attention to those kinds of things um, when you see them and if you're out in the field and, and you're looking and you, you know, you see all these birds doing this, um, take a closer look. Maybe there's an owl in there. Um, and that's a really good way to try to find them. And then lastly, looking. Um, looking for lumps in trees, promising holes, old nests, those kinds of things. Um, and it sounds funny to say, look for lumps in trees. And I have an example of that on the next slide but it, it really does work. Um, I have found several great horned owls during the day when I've been out birding for other things because I took a second look at a lump in a tree um, or I took a second look at a lump in an old nest. And so those are the kinds of things that um, pay attention to old nests, especially if you knew it was a hawk's nest or it's a big nest of some kind oftentimes owls will take them over. Um, so pay attention to the lumps in trees. If there's promising holes, maybe you won't see it the first time, but you might see it the second time. And again, in combination with the things like the next idea of looking for pellets and whitewash. So we, we already introduced the idea of pellets and we're gonna talk more about whitewash in a second, but um, this is a kind, another kind of clue that owls might be in the area. So when I talk about lumps and trees, um, this is a picture that I took uh, at a preserve in New Jersey. This lump right here, um, this is sort of at the widest angle of the camera that I had with me, the lens I had with me, um, standing on the ground looking up into a tangle of cedar trees. This lump is zoomed in the back end of a saw wet owl. And you can see this uh, dripping down here, this white, this is whitewash. And I have some close-ups of that in a second. Um, but the idea is pay attention to those lumps in trees because they might be an owl. And whitewash is basically, other than the pellet, the other mechanism for owls to um, excrete waste, not unlike other birds do as well. The difference for owls is that um, they're their waste, what we call, the reason why we call it whitewash is because it is very white. It's, it's very thick. It's kind of like latex paint almost. Um, consistency, when you see it, it's very obvious. Um, it, you can see in this picture here on the right, it's like thick on the branch, it's dripping. And this happens because, as I said before, owls tend to use the same roosts over and over and over again. So the branches get coated like this, um, the ground underneath the tree has whitewash evidence on it, usually pellets down here as well. And it can be a really good clue that an owl uses that area. Now, the owl may not use that area all the time. They might be sitting there above the whitewash, but they might use this perch, you know, at the beginning of their hunting cycle. So they might be more likely to show up here at dusk, for example. Um, and Likewise, they may move away from their daytime roost to expel their pellets so that they're not uh, encouraging any other kind of predators um, that might be interested in their pellets and trying to come after them in the trees. So they often have a couple of different areas where they will be using um, to protect themselves. But again, you can often see those um, if you're paying attention. And the difference between other birds, whitewash and owls is there's no black flecks in it. Um, it is really white. And 
oftentimes we see areas on pine trees that kind of look like they've got sort of that white wash down it, but it, it always looks sticky. Sometimes it kind of looks very green or yellow and owls is going to be really white. Um, and so that's one way to tell the difference. So I want to talk here a little bit about um, owl etiquette, because this is really important if you're going to go out and look for owls. Um, and so we want to be aware of sort of the best practices in terms of trying to see owls and how to behave around owls. Um, owls are a really sensitive species and they can abandon roosts and nests um, with too much disturbance. So we want to make sure to give them a lot of room. Um, these two pictures here, this on the left is a long-eared owl, and this one here is on the right is a great horned owl. These owls are stressed. This is what a couple of ways that owls can look stressed. So the long-eared owl has kind of straightened itself up. It's made itself skinnier and taller. Its eyes are wide open. Its ear tufts are, you know, very erect. Its head is up. Now, in this case, this owl's not staring directly at the photographer. It's staring a little bit off to the side. So it may not be the photographer that's got this owl upset. It might be prey and it's focusing in on that. It could be another person standing next to the photographer that's stressing the owl. We don't really know. Um, but generally, if the owl's looking straight at you, it's stressed. Um, this kind of, of, uh, Posturing is sort of a defensive posturing to make itself bigger and anything like that is also a sign of stress. This owl is not stressed. This is a saw white owl. Um, this is the owl that left all the whitewash on the previous slide. Um, it's not stressed. It could have cared less that we were there. And I have to say, owls are really individual. So what what may stress out one owl may not stress out another owl. So if you do see an owl and you are close to the owl, you need to be very aware of how the owl is behaving. So if it's doing these kinds of things like staring straight at you, elongating its body or doing this defensive posturing kinds of things, you want to back away. You don't want to stare right back at the owl. You want to back away if you oftentimes sort of make yourself a little smaller, crouching down a little bit. The owl sees that as a little bit less of a threat. And if you back off a little bit, oftentimes that owl will settle back down, especially if you can like partially hide yourself behind a tree, something like that. Excuse me. Keep your voice low. Don't don't talk. Ideally, those kinds of things. Um, you may be able to go on continuing to observe that owl. Sometimes it will be so stressed, it will fly. Um, and sometimes that happens because you've come across one and you didn't even realize it was there um, or, you know, it happens so fast. And, and that does happen. But if it's sitting like these guys and, you know, um, you just have to pay attention to the individual owl and how it's responding. This owl on the right, um, there were about six people around this owl. This owl had been roosting in this tree pretty much the entire winter. And it seriously did not care that there were people there, that there were photographers there. It just, it just didn't care. <laughs> it was like, it wouldn't even look at us. It wouldn't open its eyes. It wouldn't do anything. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things. Um, again, you just have to pay attention to the individual bird. The other thing that we want to do is we don't want to widely share information about owl roosts. And this is one thing, and I know beginning birders get really frustrated um, because owls don't show up on rare bird alerts. And the reason why is because they're very easily disturbed. And so if it's a species like this saw wet owl, which is one of our wintering owls, so it's only here a very limited time, or this long-eared owl, again, same thing. It's a wintering owl. For us, it's only here a very short period of time. And they're very special owls for a lot of birders because they're hard to see. If those locations of those owls were publicized on rare bird alerts, a thousand people would be there. And a thousand people would be around the tree trying to stick their binoculars, spotting scopes, cameras in the owl's face. And that never ends well for the owl. So that's the reason why they don't show up on rare bird alerts. 
Now, I will tell you that you can find information about owls and the locations where they are typically seen. It's just usually a little bit after the fact. So if you use eBird, and even if you don't use eBird, I encourage you to use eBird if you're interested in looking for owls. You can go on to eBird and you can search for great horned owls and you can see all the places that they've been sighted in our area. Or you can search for long-eared owls and see where they've been sighted in our area. What eBird does to sort of protect it is the sightings may not be exactly where that owl was. They may be, you know, in a range of error, so to speak, um, again, to protect the actual roosts. And oftentimes they're delayed in posting. But because you have access to that historical information, you can go see where owls were reported last winter or the winter before. And so that's going to give you an idea of the typical places that they are seen. And then you can put yourself in a position to maybe go take walks in those areas and see if you can find some yourself. Um, because again, a lot of these birds tend to come back to the same areas um, and roost in the same areas, if not the same trees, sometimes year after year, if they're not disturbed. And so um, you can use eBird to sort of help you understand where they might be and build on that um, with your own knowledge. If you do find a nest or a roost, um, observe it from a distance. This is a great time to get binoculars. And if you don't have binoculars, um, send me an email and I can send you some information on how to pick binoculars for yourself um, for birding. And there's some, you know, relatively inexpensive uh, binoculars that would work just fine. Uh, if you have a spotting scope, this is a perfect opportunity to be able to use it because it allows you to be um, so much further away from the bird, uh, particularly if it's on a nest. Another thing that we sometimes do for owls and owls typically will respond to playback. So if you have a recording of an owl song on your phone, sometimes you can play that and the owls will respond. But we really, really want to limit our use of that, um, especially during the breeding season, and especially if you're trying to see a great horned owl. Because if you play that in a great horned owl's territory during the breeding season, you may end up with a great horned owl on your head. And I'm not kidding. They have been known to come down and, you know, take their talons and rake across people's heads. So be aware um, that sometimes you can use a recording to hear, you know, get an owl to respond, um, but it's probably not always the best method. You may just want to listen um, and see if you can hear it yourself and be especially cautious of using them during the breeding season. So I'm going to stop here for questions really quick before we get into the species. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Okay, somebody said they're not seeing a PowerPoint. Is nobody seeing a PowerPoint? Can somebody unmute themselves and let me know if they're seeing the PowerPoint? I'm seeing the PowerPoint. Yeah, I see it clearly. Yes, my Okay, well. perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, somebody said uh, the breeding season is different for different owls. Yes, they are. And we're going to talk about that in the individual species accounts um, next. So those are all the questions that I see right now. So first, we're going to talk about the year round owls. And these owls all live and breed in our area, mostly, um, and may be found throughout the year. So they pretty much don't migrate. Um, the first one is the barn owl. Uh, this one actually really isn't in our area anymore. It's, it's actually among the most widely distributed owls worldwide, um, but it is actually a species of special concern in Pennsylvania. Uh, it should nest in our area, but it really doesn't anymore, most likely because there's not enough habitat for them. They need a lot of open country, so that's farms, barns, um, that's why they go together. And we just don't really have much of that space uh, in our immediate area anymore. They do breed in Pennsylvania, um, just not in huge numbers and not right in our immediate area, more out, you know, Harrisburg, Lancaster, um, and that part of the state. 
where the farms tend to be a little bit bigger uh, and there's more space for them to uh, maintain their territories. Um, so these guys are uh, a medium size owl, you know, weigh about a pound. Um, pretty much most of us have seen this um, and are familiar with the sort of heart shaped facial disc that this one has, uh, varying shades of white, tan, gray. Um, they don't really migrate, um, but the, at the same time, our understanding of their migration is very poor. They haven't really been studied uh, in terms of whether they actively migrate or not, but the presumption is, is that they don't really migrate. They sort of stay in the same general area. These guys are pretty strictly nocturnal. Um, they're cavity nesters. They do like to roost in barns, old buildings, attics if they can get in, uh, those kinds of things. And that's usually where you're actually more likely to encounter them is uh, on their roost. So you'll see them during the day when they're in their roost, say in the top of a barn, for example. Um, and the sound that they make is uh, a variety of screams, screeches, and hisses. And it's very un-owl like. Um, I'm going to play this and hopefully this is going to work. Um, I have it so that it's going to use my computer sound, which I'm going to turn up a little bit. <laughs> Can somebody let me know that they heard that? Yes, I heard it. Okay, great. Because um, then I know the rest of them will work. <laughs> um, so you can see that's a very un-owl-like sound, not at all what we sort of associate it with, with owls making hoot kinds of sounds. Um, it is very ear piercing. It is very identifiable um, should you happen to hear one. The next owl on our list is the barred owl. Uh, these are a large owl, very stocky, uh, very round head, no visible ear tufts, and brown eyes. This is the key um, to them. Varying levels of streaky, uh, very brown sort of overall. They are um, a little bit bigger. They're about, you know, the females can get up to about two and a half pounds. Um, and most of these birds, the females are actually the larger bird. That's true in um, the vast majority of hawks as well. Um, the females tend to be bigger overall, larger wingspan and weigh more than the males do. These birds are um, pretty much non-migratory. So they're here all year round. They are active, mostly nocturnally, but um, these are the most diurnal, so the most day active of the owls that we have in our area. They often roost in areas in the daytime when they're very visible, like this owl sitting on this branch. This is not uncommon for these owls to be right out in the open. In addition, they may also call in the daytime. Um, they are... Uh, very vocal during the breeding season. And for us here, that breeding season is March to early April. And if there's a pair of barred owls on territory, they can be extraordinarily loud and obnoxious all day long in some cases. Um, but typically dawn and dusk is when they tend to be most active. They do nest in cavities. Um, they like, um, large mature forests near water. And so that's why the Wissahickon Creek is sort of op, an optimal place for them to be in our area um, because they do like to be in sort of wet woods. That's what we tend to associate with barred owls. Um, in areas of New Jersey, they are in um, wooded swamp areas for the most part. And in our area close to creeks, um, wooded creeks and streams and things like that. Um, they do nest in cavities, but they may reuse other nests. So sometimes they may be out in the open in an old hawk nest or something like that. But more often than not, they're in a cavity. Um, yeah, I'm going to play. So they have two, two essential 
sounds that you need to know. The first one that I'm going to play for you is what we think of as sort of their song. And it's not a very musical song, but it often has um, a sound to it that we say sounds like who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And they might repeat that a couple times. So they might say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And then the second one that I'm going to play is what we call their caterwauling. But let's play their song first. So see if you can hear that pattern um, to their song. And I think, I think this is actually just one owl, but it might be two. So that's just one owl and it, the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, this is the caterwauling and this is actually two owls and they make an incredible <laughs> variety of sounds. Um, they actually will often perform duets with each other to some extent and 13 different vocalizations have been noted from these owls. So it can be very variable, um, but this is an example of what it sounds like. no way that an owl really sounds like that. They really do. Um, I've heard them in the woods doing this and they really do sound like that. And oftentimes when they're surprised by something, um, they will do this. Um, and, and kind of, it's sort of their startle response sounds a lot like that. Um, and so you can hear that um, very clearly in the woods. So that's a really good one to learn the call. Um, and keep in mind, you know, the breeding March to early April is when they tend to be most active, um, making a lot more noise. But if they're a pair on territory, they may make noise um, longer into the breeding season because they're maintaining their pair bond. So they tend to stay a little bit noisier for longer. Um, I forgot to mention for the barn owl, the previous owl, they can actually breed at any time of the year if prey is plentiful enough. Um, but again, right now we don't have any of them breeding in our immediate area, to the best of my knowledge. The next one is the great horned owl. Um, and this is actually a fairly common owl. This is a large owl, very thick bodied um, these large ear tufts on top, and these aren't actually their ears. We call them ear tufts because it's what we think they look like. They're literally just feathers. Their ears are on the side of the head, just like I showed you on that skull from the boreal owl earlier. And these guys have yellow eyes, and they can be various shades of brown, gray, white, tan, black, um, usually kind of this barring across the, the chest or the belly um, and varying shades of, of gray, brown, and white, excuse me, in there. They're generally non-migratory. These guys are pretty big, four, three to four pounds. Um, they're a big bird. You can see their feet. Um, these owls will eat skunks. Uh, they will get groundhogs if they can. Um, they're, you know, they're very opportunistic, um, but they will go after much bigger prey uh, than some of the other owls will. They will also go after smaller owls as well um, as part of their diet and birds um, if they can find them, you know, in there um, at night. Um, they're generally nocturnal, but they're, so their most active hunting time is going to be at night. But these owls often have a roost that they will go to as they're getting ready to hunt. So they often will spend their day hiding in um, deeper areas of woodlands, in pine trees, in areas that are relatively protected and maybe not as obvious. But at dusk, 
they often fly out to a roost that's more like at the edge of where they might be hunting. And then they often be, are very visible. These guys are secondary nest users, so they don't actually make their own nests. They take over other birds' nests. Um, they're very fond of red-tailed hawk nests, but they'll use nests from uh, crows or ravens, um, sometimes squirrels, and they breed very early in the year. Um, they breed, they start breeding in January and February. So they're often laying eggs and a female is sitting on the eggs, incubating them while it's snowing. Um, and part of the reason that they do that is because they take over these other birds' nests. And so say this summer, a red-tailed hawk or this spring, a red-tailed hawk built a nest uh, and raised its young. And it generally leaves the area and goes about its business for the rest of the year once it's young fledge and doesn't start setting up territories until next spring and late winter, early, early spring. By that time, these guys, the great hornells, are already breeding or have already bred. And so they move in and take over that nest and force the red tail to make another nest. And so it's a cycle that can go on. And, but this can actually be a really good way of trying to find these owls because since they do use old nests, um, if you pay attention to trees that have old nests in them in the wintertime, when all the trees, the leaves come off the trees and those big nests become easier to see, if you pay attention to them and you start looking January, February, early March timeframe, you may just find a great horned owl in there. And that honestly is how I have found a couple of, of owls. I found one in an old red-tailed hawk nest and one in a bald eagle's nest um, at a National Wildlife Preserve in Delaware uh, because I knew where the bald eagle's nest was and I actually thought there were baby bald eagles in it until I realized, no, it was actually a family of great horned owls. Um, and so that was really cool. And you really, pay attention to them and look for them. Uh, make it a point to look for old nests and see if you can see an owl using them. Uh, these guys like mixed habitat, it's fractured woodlands, um, open areas to hunt. Um, they don't, they're not quite as picky about their habitat as the barred owls are. So they're fairly common um, and fairly easy to hear. They sound, they have four to uh, five to seven deep resonant hoots that they give. Um, this is what most of us think of as the quintessential owl sound. And that's actually two owls. They're kind of talking to each other. This one is sometimes represented as who's awake, me too. Uh, if that helps you sort of remember the song, see if you can hear that when I play this again. And remember, this is two owls talking to each other. Oops, sorry. Play that again. Um, this sound actually carries fairly far. Um, so the owls can be pretty far away from you and you can actually hear this um, pretty well. And because of their profile, that stockiness, that head with the big ear tufts, great horn owls are actually pretty easy to see if you're paying attention, even if you don't have great views of them. So oftentimes this is what we see. Um, and they're fairly recognizable even at dusk perched on top of a pole, a tree, um, because of those ear tufts on top and sort of that general shape of them. Um, same with this picture over here. This one's not sitting up quite as straight, but still kind of that stocky shape with those big ear tufts at the top. It's a giveaway that it's an owl. And excuse me, then these two pictures in the middle are what I was saying before. These are owls that have taken over nests um, and are using them. And so oftentimes you can see um, the snow on the owl as it's sitting on eggs or maybe young, it's, we don't know um, here. And then, you know, the owl peering over the corner of the top of the nest here. Um, and that is actually one of the best ways to try to see a great horned owl is to find an old nest and sort of stake it out and just keep watching um, and see if an owl shows up. 
the last um, owl that's in our area all year round is the eastern screech owl. Uh, these guys are little. They're pretty small. Um, they have yellow eyes and ear tufts as well. And they come in two different color morphs. Uh, we call them red, which is the one here on the left, and gray. Um, sometimes the red are more brown than red, but they're red anyway. Uh, red and gray. It's they just come that way. Um, it's not a sex thing. It's not an age thing. It's not a location thing. They they they're just variable, um, either red or gray. And red and gray may breed together and have more red or more gray and a mixed you know set of kids, so to speak. So um, it's just a genetic thing. These guys are you know what little not even quite half a pound maybe. Um, they're small. Um, they're not migratory. They're very nocturnal. Um, they nest in cavities and yeah, generally speaking, aside from hearing them late at night, um, these guys tend not to start calling until it's really dark. Um, they're not very active um, at dawn and dusk like some of the other owls are. They're much more likely to call um, when it's full dark outside and full night. But because they nest in cavities, they can often be seen sticking their head out of a nest cavity. Um, and so they can be found that way. And they often have um, even sort of knots in trees that they might um, sort of roost in, even if it's not a full cavity, but something that makes them feel protected. And they will often return to that over and over and over again. Um, they have two sounds that you want to sort of listen for. One is the descending whinny call, as we call it. That's what this one sounds like. Um, very un owl like again as well. It really kind of sort of does sound like a horse almost. I, I will play this again. And these, these calls tend to be fairly higher pitch than some of the other owls that we've heard um, so far tonight. And then the other sound that they make is this monotone trill. And they give both of those calls um, during the breeding season not during the breeding season. Uh, these guys are breeding March, April timeframe. So similar to the um, barred owls. It's only the great horned owl that breeds much earlier uh, than the other two. And barn owls can breed um, at any time of the year. These guys thrive in a variety of habitats. Um, they're best in sort of fragmented patchy habitats with forests and edges. Um, they're actually fairly common in, in relatively urban areas and suburban areas. Um, they will use nest boxes in people's backyards. Um, I've never known anybody that had a nest box that was actually active in their backyard. I don't know anybody that's actually tried. Um, but my understanding is, is that they will use nest boxes uh, in backyards if there's enough room, if there's not too much disturbance in the area. Um, but success is generally better if there's more than one nest box in an area. So if you have habitat that you think might be good, um, somewhat open areas, if you have, you know, lots of areas with privacy fences between all the neighbors and that kind of stuff, maybe not so great as some more open backyard areas. Um, but you might want to talk to your neighbors and see about putting up uh, nest boxes and seeing if you can attract some screech owls to your area because they may be out there anyway, you're just not aware of it. Um, and as I said, these guys are much more nocturnal uh, than the other two owls. And they eat a wide range of prey, um, small mammals, they eat insects, um, whatever they can kind of get their mouth around um, to some extent. to the next slide. Okay. Best places to try to find owls for the year round owls. So barn owls. Um, 
as I said, in our immediate area, not really many here uh, at all. So you can get really lucky. You can try to make friends with a farmer out in the middle of the, the state. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to be harder to find for sure. Um, there is a nest box at Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware. Um, on the driving loop, towards kind of the end of the driving loop, there is a, an old corn crib that they don't use anymore as farmers used to lease land inside the refuge. Um, they don't do that anymore, but there's an old corn crib there that has a big owl box in it now. <laughs> there are still barn owls there. Now, I'm going to say this with a grain of salt because I have been birding that place for years and years and years. And every time I drive past that corn crib, I look in that box to see if the owls will stick their head out. They never have. Um, but last year, I was checking on eBird as I was preparing for this presentation last year, and they, somebody had reported with pictures out barn owls in that box. So they are still there. Um, you know, you may get lucky. I don't know. That's the only place I know for sure uh, that they are. Barred owls, however, are a little bit easier, um, especially if you want to listen for them. There's lots of places to try around our area. Uh, if you want to try to look for them, again, use those tips that I suggested, looking for uh, the lumps in the trees, um, listening for them, watching for songbirds mobbing and things like that. Um, there have been nesting ones in previous years on the Lavender Trail in the lower part of the Wissahickon Park. Excuse me. Um, they are at Four Mills. We've seen them there um, a couple of times, heard them several times, and um, also at Gwynedd Preserve, the natural lands property. Um, there, I'm pre presuming that they nest there as well, although I don't know that that's confirmed. Great horned owls um, heard and seen both at Gwinnett Preserve, uh, our Crossways Preserve, um, probably a wide variety of spaces in our, our area. Um, they're probably at Armand Trout Preserve. Um, there's any number of places that they could be seen or heard. Screech owls, um, because they need cavities, um, they're a little bit more particular, um, but I know that there's nesting ones at Armand Trout Preserve. I've heard them throughout the year several times. Um, they are, I've seen them once. I don't know exactly where the nest is. Um, I would love to try to find it, but haven't yet, um, but they are there. I will say, be careful if you plan on going to Armand Trout at dawn or dusk. Um, the neighbors around that area um, and the police patrol that fairly frequently, um, and they may give you a hard time if you're there after dark because technically it closes at dark, so or at dusk. So um, just be aware of that. Um, you know, maybe pick another spot uh, if you're, you know, going to go sit out there in the dark. There are nest boxes uh, for screech owls at Carpenter's Woods in Philadelphia, um, and there have been breeding ones there for years. Uh, there are screech owls in Fort Washington State Park, um, not far from the Hawk Watch. Uh, in that general area, and then also um, have heard them several times at Four Mills and also at our Crossways Preserve as well. So, and then this actually is back at Bombay Hook. This is a screech out in a, a wood duck box. And if you try to go to Bombay Hook to see the barn owls, pay attention to all of the uh, nest boxes like this that they have along the wildlife drive because there are screech owls in a couple of them and sometimes they stick their heads out um, and you can see them. So um, that's another good way of seeing um, the screech owls. Okay, I'm gonna stop here for questions and I did see a bunch of stuff come into the chat. So, whoops. Um, so somebody, do they ever perch rest on dead tall trees? Yes, um, especially great horned owls like to do that. Um, it's kind of like surveying the lay of the land, um, so to speak, and they will do that. Barred owls may do that as well, um, for sure. Screech owls, not so much. They tend to always sort of stay more in, a, in some kind of cover uh, in a little bit more protected area, uh, but the the 
great horned owls especially um, can be seen out in the open a lot. Um, the regular amount of eggs that they produce, uh, you know, it really varies. Um, they can produce as few as one to two. Um, some, some of them can go four or five, sometimes six. A lot of it depends on the amount of food that they have and sort of the overall health of the habitat that they're in. Um, think usually though they're on the lower end. So two to three, um, maybe four in a really good year uh, because they, do take a lot of work. They're, they're bigger birds overall. Um, and so it's a lot more um, energy for the parents to expend to raise them. So ten, they tend not to have um, very large clutch sizes. But you'll see some owls um, that we're gonna talk about in a minute can actually lay a lot more eggs depending on the availability of prey. Pretty sure I spotted a group of three owls one evening earlier this year. Is this typical? Actually, it may be, um, especially if it was at a time when, so a couple of things could be happening. If it was early in the breeding season, it could have been um, owls trying to defend territory or set up territory and kind of, you know, feeling each other out and seeing who's doing what and, you know, having a meeting of the mind, so to speak. Um, it could also have been, depending on the timing of it, um, young owls, because they'll tend to congregate together a little bit uh, more so than adults will, or it could have been, you know, a parent and some fledglings. So it is possible to see um, groups of owls uh, sometimes for sure. And I wouldn't say it's typical, but it, it does happen. Um, yeah, I, I do, you know, yes, do discourage playing the calls really no matter what. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard. Um, they do respond, but it's not the best way to try to find them for sure. Um, are cats part of an owl's diet? You know, I don't know. They could be, especially a great horned owl um, might go after a cat uh, if it could. Um, that would be the only one in our area that would be likely to do that. Um, and I honestly don't know how much they do that. Do owls go after bats? Yes, they can go after bats for sure. Oh, there you go. Some screech owl often in the wood duck box at Peace Valley right at the bird blind. Thanks. Good to know. I was not aware of that one. Um, Boy, how many types of owls in the world? A lot, actually. Um, I don't know right offhand the actual number. Um, but yeah, even for the United States, the eight that I'm covering tonight are a really small subset of, of all of the owls uh, in North America, even. Um, Often hear a screech owl over multiple seasons in our very wooded backyard. Could it be the same owl or do they move around? It, it very well could be the same owl um, for sure. They all, if they're successful in an area and they're not disturbed, um, they're very likely to stay there year after year. And especially screech owls, they don't migrate. Um, so yep, they're, they're uh, likely um, the same owl. Um, and owls do live multiple years. Um, owls tend to be a little bit longer lived than a lot of our songbirds. And so, you know, it's multiple generations they could be raising in that area. And if the adult owls um, pass away, then it's likely that their offspring could stay in the same area because that's where they were raised and their parents were successful. And so um, they may not have gone very far. So um, it could be the same ones. So is where you hear them at night a good place to look during the day? Yeah, um, that's usually a good indication that they're in that area. And, you know, sometimes barred owls, especially, especially young barred owls can kind of wander. So you might hear them one night in one place and then never hear them again. Um, but for the most part, if you're hearing an owl fairly regularly, um, in the same spot, then yeah, that's a good place to sort of try to go investigating during the day. Um, do they mate for life? That's a really good question. 
So for the birds that are not migratory in our area, I do believe that they keep the same mate year after year as long as they're successful. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to. Um, if they're not successful with a particular mate or the female doesn't feel like the male is pulling his fair share, she may go look for another mate next year. Um, for the owls that migrate, I'm not sure if they find the same mates every year or try to find the same mates again every year or if they look for new mates every year. I don't actually remember. When are great horned owls most active or easiest to spot? So dawn or dusk um, really is the best time to see them. They're gonna call sometimes at dawn or dusk. I've had better luck at dusk as they're getting ready to go hunting. Um, not so much at, at dawn, um, but they also call a lot at night. So they can be you know, very active in, uh, in, in, uh, in the dark and, and that's when they may be easiest to hear. Um, but usually dusk is the best time to see them unless you see a lump in a tree. Um, and most of the owls that I found as lumps in trees were great horned owls. And that's simply just because they're the biggest ones in our area, they're the easiest to see. Um, yeah, that's a, a good point. And I, I don't really have that so much in my presentation, but the idea that um, we shouldn't be using rodent poison uh, because if a rodent eats poison on your property or in an area that you are and then doesn't get killed immediately right there and leaves, owls may try to get it and then the poisons can uh, uh, impact the owls as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. So next, um, the last four owls, the owls of winter. Three of these owls actually do breed in Pennsylvania, but in very limited numbers and not in our immediate area. So I think of them more as these are the things that we are seeing typically migrating from northern breeding grounds in the Arctic and Canada and are most commonly found from around December to March in our immediate area. And for us, I say immediate area for this, I'm sort of broadly including Delaware and New Jersey as well, because as you'll see, some of the more common places to see these owls, some of these owls is actually um, along the Jersey shore. So keep that in mind. Um, the first one is the Northern Sawwet Owl. Um, this is the one you saw the picture of before. Uh, these guys are pretty small, um, four and a quarter ounces, um, just about eight inches tall. Um, they're pretty little. Um, they're migratory, but they're very variable in their migration. And we, some migrate hundreds of miles, some hardly move. Um, it seems like more females and immature males migrate and adult males tend to stay on territory, which tends to be in the boreal forest um, for the most part. They're, um, these guys are really a forest owl. They're not really an owl of open country at all. They like, the, we associate them mostly with um, boreal conifer forests. So think, you know, Northern Canada, but they actually do use a variety of forests, um, but really they're most abundant where humans are rarest, um, which is why we don't understand a lot of their breeding activity very well, because they often breed in areas that are really hard for researchers to get to, um, to study the owls. They are cavity nesters and they're um, really active nocturnally, but they will roost in places where they can be seen and like I said before, this owl could have cared less that all of us are standing there taking pictures of them. More often they roost in very dense tangles. Um, they love cedar trees. So in areas where there are a lot of cedar trees and especially if there's a bunch of red cedar trees kind of together, that's a good place to think that a saw wet might be um, inhabiting for the winter uh, and to take a look. Um, they are probably more common than we realize. They're just very, very good at escaping detection. Um, and on the breeding grounds, particularly, they're, they're very nocturnal and they're very secretive, um, again, which makes it hard to study them. 
So they have a variety of sounds that they make. I'm going to play two different ones here, but this article down here that I, I put the title of here, um, Out Owling for Sawwets. This is from uh, the American Birding Association's blog. So you can just search American Birding Association uh, and you know, owling for sawwets, and I'm sure you can find this article. The author of this um, shows that there's a lot of different sounds that these owls make and probably sounds that we weren't necessarily associating with them might actually be sawwets that we're hearing um, based on some work that they've done and some studies, you know, just other birders um, and recordings that have been made of the, the owls themselves. So I encourage you to go take a look at that. It's a little bit more in depth than I wanted to go tonight, but I did wanna make you aware of it because there's lots of different sounds that they make. And some of these sounds are much more common on the breeding grounds and some are more common now. Um, so the one that I'm going to play here is one that they often make when they're flying um, during migration. So repeated beeping sound for lack of a better word. Um, and then here's another one, um, that another sound that they will make. A lot, this article talks um, about that variability. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in trying to know if you're hearing sawwets, that's a, a really good article to check out. Um, so the next slide that I have, so this is um, a northern sawwet owl, and this is where a kind of an example of where they might roost. Um, this is actually a picture from Florida, I think. Um, and I don't know if you can see the owl, but it's right here. I have a zoomed in picture. So, you know, it's, that's usually how you see a saw white owl. Um, they're not often, not always out in the open like the previous picture, although they can be. Um, it just depends on the individual owl, but they, they do like to nest in or roost in, you know, sort of tangles like this. Um, but again, if they're not disturbed, if they found a good roost, they will stay there. So um, whitewash builds up, pellets build up. And so even if the owl isn't there right then, you can often see evidence of the owl being there um, because they, if they've got a roost where they haven't been disturbed, they'll pretty much spend the winter there, um, it, especially you know the migrating birds to our area. So keep that in mind. Um, the next one is a long-eared owl. Um, these guys are a little bit bigger. Um, they're still kind of medium-sized owls. They're, they're very slender. They're very reminiscent of the great horned owl. Their ear tufts are longer, and overall, they're sort of longer and skinnier uh, than a great horned owl. Now, they can sit you know, in different positions, but for the most part, these guys are always going to look smaller, and they're going to look narrower than the great horned owl will. Um, and their ear tufts are actually bigger uh, than the great horned. Um, they are migratory. Uh, so they're usually here, you know, December to March, roughly in this area. Uh, they may be an eruptive species. And I'm going to talk more about eruptive, what that means with one of the other uh, birds. But mostly, it just means that um, some years, there may be a lot of them here. Uh, and some years, there may only be a few of them here. They're fairly nocturnal. Actually, they're very nocturnal in terms of hunting and activity. But they often roost in groups and they often roost in pine trees that are fairly easy to see into. So here's some pictures of some other roosting owls. So you can see one here trying to blend in with the pine cones. Um, and then because they tend to roost in groups in the winter, you can often see more than one. 
So there's four owls visible in this picture here, and this lump over here might be another owl. I'm not sure. This is not my picture, so I'm not positive, but there are four here for sure that are owls. Um, and so oftentimes when there's a winter roost, there's more than one owl. They are secondary nest users like the great horned owl, but not as relevant for us because they're not nesting right in our area and they're generally silent when they're here. So the sounds that they make aren't really as relevant. Um, they may make a startled kind of barking squawk if they're startled um, on their roost, but for the most part, they're pretty quiet when they're here. Um, Short-eared owl. These guys are also um, kind of a medium-sized owl. They're sandy colored, heavily streaked um, overall, very round head. Um, they're, even though they're short-eared owls is their name, their ear tufts usually really aren't visible. Um, occasionally you might see them popped up, but for the most part, you never see their ear tufts. Um, they are migratory, so again, here only in the winter. Um, they're, these are active diurnal-ish. Um, so these guys are more, probably the owl that is the most likely to be seen in the daylight if you're in the right habitat. Um, they will hunt and actively hunt at dawn or dusk. And even on very overcast winter days, they may hunt, you know, two in the afternoon. Um, if it's if it's overcast enough for them. So there they can be um, very active when it's daylight, more than just, you know, flying to a roost um, like the great horns might do. They will actively be hunting when you can actually see them, um, which is pretty cool. They nest and roost on the ground. So you're not going to find these guys up in the tree. They're actually going to be sitting on the ground. So you're probably not going to see them roosting much. Occasionally, they'll roost on a fence post or a very small tree in an area of open field or marsh. Um, but a lot of times, they actually roost right on the ground. And you don't actually see them until they come up and start hunting. And generally, they're fairly silent when they're here. Um, they have a very distinctive flight pattern. So they hold their wings in what we call a dihedral, so this sort of upward V shape. Um, and that makes them pretty obvious um, when they're out there flying. And I actually, the next slide, this is a, a video of a short-eared owl hunting. Um, and so two things that I want you to notice. They kind of have, a lot of people say they look like a moth when they're flying. I'm not sure that this video shows that as well as it could, but they do have a sort of very bouncy flight style. And I do tend to think in person, they sort of look like a big giant moth flying around. The other thing I want you to notice is how sort of flat fronted they look um, when they fly. And this is true of all owls. Because of that facial disc, because of their eyes facing forward, they, they look much different than a hawk when they're flying. And so often they kind of look like they don't like their head ends weirdly. It's sort of chopped off in the front, um, even though it's still there. But when it's flying, it's a very distinctive profile that they make. And to an extent, all owls look like that when they're flying. So even if you see something, you know, at dawn or dusk, you can often tell if it's an owl versus a hawk just by the way the front of their head looks. So here we go. You can see this is daylight. I mean, this is, you know, it's not sunny, bright. Uh, it's probably a very overcast day. Um, this is not my video, but, you know, it's out and it's actively hunting. And these are birds of open areas. They like marshes. They like big grasslands. Um, so that's the kind of place that you need to think about trying to see these owls. And in areas with a lot of food, um, you can see more than one owl in the same area. Um, the place that I'm going to show you uh, at the end of, of the best place I know to see these owls, there's often more than one out there. So that just gives you an idea that, that yep, went down, <laughs> doesn't come back up. So that's it. Um, but 
you know, these are probably the owl that if you do a little bit of work, you're actually most likely to see flying around um, when you can actually see them well. Uh, and there's still some light in the sky. Uh, the last owl is a snowy owl. Uh, these guys are big, uh, about four and a half pounds um, for the heaviest females. Um, you know, almost five feet, a little over five feet, sometimes wingspan. Um, they're big owls. They're varying shades of uh, white and black. Um, they have yellow eyes. The, the variability is, you know, generally females and younger birds tend to be more be darker, so more black barring on them, but there's a lot of variability. Um, older birds and males tend to be whiter, um, but you can't know just from looking at it what it is um, based on the color. Um, so there's a lot of variability there. These guys breed in the Arctic tundra zones in northern Canada, and the locations where they breed are actually determined by lemming populations. So the locations of snowy owls breeding grounds actually moves around from year to year. Um, they don't always go back to exactly the same area. They go to wherever the lemmings are most populous. Um, they show up irregularly here on migration. They do migrate down. But their migration is really irregular and re can be really eruptive. And we're going to talk more about that um, in the next couple of slides. Typically, there's anywhere from one to maybe a half a dozen around a broad area of us um, in a typical year uh, in a variety of habitats. But again, think wide open spaces. Uh, these guys nest in the tundra on the ground, they roost on the ground. So this picture here, this is how you see them. Um, this is a picture that I took uh, at Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. This is a wintering snowy owl uh, on the refuge. I'm in my car on the wildlife drive there. And yeah, it's just sitting out in the marsh, in the grass. And that's how you see them for the most part. Occasionally, they'll be up on a small tree, a small fence post. Uh, they like airports. They like big farm fields, you know, national wildlife refuges like this with, with big areas of open marsh, those kinds of things. Um, the eruptions happen irregularly and that's really sort of this massive southward migration. Uh, what we think of as kind of mini eruptions happen roughly every four years or so. And then, and they may be sort of regionally specific. So sometimes the owls only erupt into the upper Great Lakes region. Sometimes they only erupt into our region. Sometimes they erupt everywhere. And once or twice in a lifetime, a mega eruption happens. Uh, and, and these happen much less frequently, um, but they do happen. And these guys are nocturnal. They roost, they only really hunt at night, but because they roost on the ground like this, you're often able to see them in broad daylight. Um, and as long as they're not disturbed, they'll just stay there. They tend to turn themselves um, into the sun. They like to face the sun, but other than that, they typically won't move a whole lot um, during the day. Uh, they're very active uh, nocturnally to hunt and they hunt a wide variety of prey all the way up to and including um, diving sea ducks and geese. Um, so they're, these guys are pretty, pretty aggressive hunters um, when they're going after their prey. So one of those mega eruptions happened in the winter of 2013. And I'm gonna use this to talk about what an eruption is um, and what we learned from it and some of the really cool things that came out of this. So um, oftentimes we think, so there was sort of this perception that because snowy owls depend on lemmings, if the lemming population falls, then starving owls wandering are the ones that show up here. And so if the lemming population falls, really far, then more owls wander and they're starving and they're coming down here looking for food because there's nothing up in the snowy tundra anymore. And so they need to move to find food. That's not true. Um, and kind of this winter eruption sort of put 
that all in perspective for a lot of people. Um, this is a map of eBird sightings of snowy owls in December of 2013. That's a lot of snowy owls. <laughs> now, some of these may have been the same owl that moved a little bit, you know, locally. Some of them may have been owls that moved further away, but even still, that is a lot of snowy owls for early in the winter uh, showing up on eBird. And it led to a lot of scenes like this <laughs> um, around the area where people were going out to see these owls um, because there were so many of them. In some places, some cases, you could actually see more than one owl at the same place. So like a refuge like Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge might have had two, even three owls on it, um, which is really unusual. So researchers started communicating and talking and realized that this was a, a, a really unique opportunity. Um, they also were able to put together information from researchers who work with the owls on their breeding ground to realize that it wasn't that the lemming population fell in the summer of 2013, essentially spring and summer when the owls would have been breeding. It was that the lemming population exploded. So there were so many lemmings that these owls ended up laying way more eggs than they normally would. So this is a snowy owl nest. They nest on the ground. There's four eggs in here. Um, it's my understanding that this nest was probably not finished yet. They found nests that had 10 eggs in them. There are 70 dead lemmings and eight voles. So the male of, of this group partnership was hunting lemmings and voles and provided 78 sources of food for eggs that weren't even done yet. So that abundance of prey pushes the female owl sort of into overdrive and they start laying a lot more eggs because the prey is so plentiful. So then what happened is those, because there were so many young owls, they started meandering everywhere. They actually ended up in Florida. Uh, there was one on one of the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. I mean, it was unbelievable. And there were just tons of owls. Um, so there was an estimated 8,000 birds that were sighted, you know, across the region. Researchers realized that this was a really unique opportunity to study these owls because there were so many of them. So Project Snowstorm was born. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first crowdsourced research project. Uh, researchers realized that they could not um, grant fund this project quickly enough because the owls would be gone before they could get any grant money. Um, the owls would leave here. Um, some probably start leaving in February. Um, by March, certainly most of them would be gone. And so, um, you know, here they are in December and they need to figure out a way to maximize the fact that there's so many owls down here. So what they did was they put a, a funding request on Indiegogo and they got enough money to, and they worked with the, the um, uh, manufacturer of uh, solar panel, solar powered um, data packs that they were able to um, trap and put onto a number of the owls to understand how they moved in migration. And so the, the transmitters um, work over our cell tower system. So anytime they're in contact with cell towers, they download information um, either every 15 or 30 minutes, depending on how the researchers set up the program. So they can get an idea of this is the activities of one owl. Um, they can get an idea of how that owl's moving, where they're hunting, where they're roosting. So you can see they're, they would probably spend a lot of their time roosting right here because that's where the bulk of the data points are from. And that was probably where they were every day for maybe a month or even two. And so they could get all this data. And the really cool thing about these packs is they're solar charged and they can hold almost five years worth of data. So when the birds went back north, 
it would still be collecting data and any time that bird flew south enough to come in contact with a cell tower, it would download the data for the researchers. So they've been able to continue to get data on some of the birds that they uh, tagged uh, in 2013 because they keep going back up to the Arctic and then come down enough, um, even if they don't come all the way back down as much as they did in 2013, they come enough down to hit a cell tower. Um, so it's a really, really cool research project and way more information about it than I can go into here tonight, but I encourage you to go to their website. It literally is Project Snowstorm. It's still active. They're still taking donations should you choose to donate. They're still monitoring owls. And it's probably the best place I know of to get an indication of how many owls are in the area in a winter because they're, they're posting information about where they found owls, where they're tagging owls. Um, and it's, it's not really a rare bird alert, but it's going to give you the best indication of where snowy owls might be seen um, in any given winter. So I don't know this year um, if there's going to be a large movement of them down or not. There was a fairly decent movement last year. So that kind of usually means this year might not be so great because it's kind of that four year cycle. So uh, but we'll see. And just to round it out, this is a picture of, of a 2013 owl that I took at Forsyth. Um, it hadn't had a battery, you know, uh, transmitter attached to it. Um, but again, this is how you find them um, sitting out in the marsh, um, you know, eyes barely open, um, just chilling. And that's what they do. So again, this is one of the ones that you're more likely to see um, in broad daylight, um, but most likely it'll just be sitting there. So where to find owls in the winter? Solid owls really could show up anywhere um, other than the place that I have seen them and I know that they tend to have them annually, which is Mercer Meadows Park in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Um, I don't really know how to tell you else to look for them other than try to listen for them. If you've got areas where there's a bunch of cedar trees, you know, give them a check and see. Um, look for pellets, look for whitewash, that kind of thing. Long-eared owls. Um, typically Peace Valley Park near the Nature Center. Uh, they were annual for a lot of years. I believe they're back based on reports I've seen in eBird. Um, they like the pine stands. So this is the Nature Center here. There's a big stand of pines here, also here, and then along the backside here. Uh, they can kind of be anywhere. Uh, I will say if you do go to Peace Valley to look for them, I've gone uh, I have to say, I've gone numerous times to try to see them. I have yet to see this. I've never seen this owl. So, um, but I do know if they are easily disturbed. So if you go to look for them, please, please, please stay on the mark trails. Um, obey any areas that the Nature Center staff has marked off um, to try to protect the owls. Please don't go past any barriers that they put up. If they say an area is closed, please respect that uh, because that you know, that is a, a significant disturbance to the owls. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that they do come back to the area and, and are seen by as many people as can see them. So just pay attention to any rules that may be posted uh, when you're there, if you do go to try to find the owls. Short-eared owls, um, uh, they are seen at Valley Forge Park um, somewhat regularly. Um, I've never looked for them there, so I can't speak to that. Where I typically go look for them is um, Jake's Landing Road, which is halfway to Cape May. <laughs> Essentially, it's on the Delaware Bay Shore. Um, this, it's a road, uh, an area of upland forest. It's off of Route 47. You come through the road on the upland forest. This is where there's also nesting great horned owls. So this is a bonus because you usually get two owls for the price of one if you try it. Um, there's a road here that goes down to a boat launch and a small parking lot. Uh, it literally dead ends into the marsh and the, the um, boat launch. But often there are short-eared owls hunting the marsh at dusk. And like I said, there's a, there's a lot of dead trees around the edge of the forest and the great horned owls. Um, you can often hear them and oftentimes they will come out and perch uh, in the dead trees at the end of the for at the edge of the forest um, at dusk as well. So bonus there. And then snowy owl. Um, in typical years, places like Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge um, and other places along the New Jersey coast tend to be the easiest places to see them. Um, they're sometimes at Barnegat Light, Island Beach State Park, 
uh, Stone Harbor Point, things like that. Um, but in eruptive years, they can be anywhere at all. Um, so there have been, there was one in uh, a couple of years ago that showed up on a lamppost um, right off of the 309 interchange. Um, and it was roosting up there for the day. So um, on eruptive years, they can kind of be anywhere. And again, think those big wide open spaces. Um, so more local areas to us, places like um, Gwynedd, uh, Preserve, uh, Dixon Meadow, maybe there's enough farmland around there. Um, but yeah, places like that um, are where they're more likely to show up. Uh, as well. And with snowy owls, I will just say because um, some of them, they literally will roost on the beach um, behind a small dune or beside a small dune, a, you know, a small tuft of grass. And that's literally the protection that they have because it's like the Arctic tundra. There's not a lot of trees up there. They're not looking for trees to, you know, for protection. So if you do happen to see snowy owls and they're on the beach, and you're walking on the beach, uh, keep that owl etiquette in mind, stay away from them, um, try to stay far enough that they don't react to you. Uh, you don't want them to try to fly, if at all possible, don't disturb them, you know, stay, keep your distance um, and, and watch them from a distance um, so that we minimize disturbance to them because literally they can be uh, roosting on the beach. So I'm gonna stop here for questions. Um, this is the same picture that was at the beginning. This is a barred owl uh, that I took this picture at Four Mills um, in April-ish. No, it was this year. So it was, it had to be March, early March. Um, we were hoping that the that this bird, we actually think there were two birds um, there, were gonna stay and breed. Uh, we don't have evidence that they did, but it was highly encouraging that they were there um, close to the breeding season. They may have sort of been scoping things out. Um, could have been young owls, didn't find exactly what they were looking for, whatever. Um, but, you know, again, this is that pay attention to the lumps in the trees um, and, you know, you might get lucky, you never know. So I'm going to see if there's any questions here and then we'll wrap up for the night. Yes, <laughs> I forgot to mention that the sawwet owl is, is exactly the tree that was rescued from the Rockefeller Christmas tree that apparently my understanding is it, it has been named Rockefeller by the, the people that are um, nursing it back to health. It's um, pretty good in good shape as far as I know. Um, it was taken to a rescue center. Yeah, it was trapped inside a tree and inside the Christmas tree uh, that they brought to Rockefeller um, Center. I actually did see somebody made a comment. Um, apparently, and I saw a post about this the other day on social media as well. There are a number of sawwet owls in New York City right now. So it looks like it might be a good year for migrating sawwets and wintering sawwets in sort of the general area. Now, whether that's gonna translate to sort of the Philadelphia area, I'm not entirely positive, but there have been a bunch of sightings already um, in New York, even in New York City, like in Central Park and stuff like that. So um, again, keep your eyes and ears out. There may be sawwets out there this year. Um, Short-eared owls, would they prefer tall grasslands in a preserve or cover crop on a farm? Um, my experience with them has been more tall grasslands um, than cover crops on farms kind of fields. Um, so I, I would say probably more tall grassland kind of things. Um, so that's the last question I think. Thanks for all the nice comments. Yes, um, go hunt owls, hunt owls, so to speak. Um, I, I wish you luck. Um, I hope this gives you some tools to try to find them. And, um, you know, if you see any good ones, let me know. Um, Cause I, I really hope that uh, people have the opportunity um, to see some of these folks. So thanks for joining us tonight. And this is our last program for 2020. So stay tuned to our calendar for uh, upcoming programs in 2021. We're working on that right now. Um, looks like at least beginning of the year is gonna be virtual. 
Um, but, you know, we may have some opportunities for some more in-person things um, and uh, uh, some walks and hikes and things like that. So um, keep an eye on our calendar and hope to see you then. Hope everybody has a very nice Thanksgiving and a wonderful holiday season. Um, and I'll see you in 2021. Bye.